Have you ever been asked the question, why is suicide a sin? Now, at first, you might think it's strange that someone would pose such a question. However, in our secular, materialistic, and atheistic culture, explaining why suicide is obviously wrong may be difficult, but to a faithful child of God and all that the New Testament defines that to be, it is not such a difficult thing because of the view the Bible teaches of one's own self. Now, the Bible nowhere explicitly in just so many words tells anyone you shall not take your own life. If you look up the definition of suicide, then, of course, it is simply self-murder. A person has decided to end one's own life. But this is no different from a person who decides to end someone else's life. And even under the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, 13 says, Thou shalt not kill. Literally, it is you shall do no murder, which would cover not only me murdering somebody else, but me murdering myself. Now, this is not at all like a civil government administering the death penalty for a crime that calls for such. In Romans chapter 13 and verse 4, speaking of civil government, and its authority delegated to them by God. For he is the minister of God for thee, or to thee, for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. God delegated then civil governments the authority to execute evildoers. Now, all the time when you say such things as I said, even so far into the sermon, people say, well, look at all the mistakes made, etc." Well, you could say that about anybody concerning virtually any responsibility you have before God. Look at the people that violate it. Look at the people that abuse it. You can look at the people that corrupt it. So I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about what the Word of God said. And Romans chapter 13, especially verse 4 right here that I read, will read and mean on the day of judgment just what it means and how it reads now. God said back in the patriarchal age, as Moses by inspiration of the Holy Spirit records it, Whoso sheddeth man's blood... By man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. Genesis 9, 6. Of course, that shows us why, although there are many other scriptures that do the same thing, that we should value our own lives and the lives of others. Of himself, the apostle Paul declared... For if I be an offender, or have committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. Acts 25 verse 11. Now, if all putting to death by civil government was murder and therefore sin, Paul would never say anything like this. We must understand that all killing is not murder. Murder is forbidden by anybody that governments can engage in it is so true and the Nazis if nobody else in the world stands as a prime example when they were the government of Germany of going about doing that so it would be of the communist but we're talking about what God authorizes in his word concerning the work of civil government and you can read all of chapter 13 to see that 
And if I can believe Mark 16, 15, and 16, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Then I can read and believe the inspired word of God in Romans 13 concerning civil government and the authority it has to execute judgment to the point of the death sentence. If not, then I'm picking and choosing what part of the Bible I'll allow to be the word of God and what part will be. Now, once you acknowledge that suicide is self-murder and you understand that all murder is sin, then it seems clear to me that you would recognize that suicide is the transgression of God's law, which is the definition of sin, 1 John 3, 4. John even says this writing to Christians concerning the attitude we're to have one toward another. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer meaning he's already done it in his heart and we do well to remember as a man thinketh in his heart so is he so the deed is done in mind before it's actually done in the physical act but he then says and you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him first john three fifteen. so if there is a person a brother or sister in christ who has such an attitude then they need to cut it out of their mind. For we're to love the brethren, and we're to love everybody as our neighbor. We're willing to do good to anybody. And Jesus even talked about doing good to those who are enemies. We can always will an enemy good. Doesn't mean you're going to feel like uh, toward them, like as your wife or husband or mother or daddy or children, but you can always will them good. I think, while we started with the question, why is suicide sin, that to get right down to it, a more apt question is, why should anyone, someone, want to end his or her own life? Why should it, someone want to end one's own life? Many times in reading through the Bible, you'll find something that is said uh, so-and-so despaired. We don't say that a lot of times today. When you run across that, it really means they've gone into what we call today depression. A very real thing in our society. It's the attitude, it's the state of mind, the mindset that concludes simply that life in the flesh on earth is not worth living. One concludes that there's simply whatever situation they're in, there's no way out of this terribly bad situation. There is no future hope at all for a better tomorrow. And it goes from that to even worse. Now I want you to consider Job in Job chapter 3. I want us to look, well, in fact, you can read all the way down through 11. We'll look at it as we have time. Job chapter 3. After this opened Job his mouth and cursed his day. And Job spake and said, here's how he did it. Let the day perish wherein I was born, and the night in which it was said, there's a man child conceived. Let that day be darkness, let not God regard it. From above, neither let the light shine upon it. Let darkness and the shadow of death stain it. Let a cloud dwell upon it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it. As for that night, let darkness seize upon it. Let it not be joined unto the days of the year. Let it not come into the number of the months. Lo, let the night be solitary. Let no joyful voice come therein. Let them curse it that curse the day who are ready to raise up their morning. Let the stars of the twilight thereof be dark. Let it look for light, but have none. Neither let it see the dawning of the day, because it shut not up the doors of my mother's womb, nor hid sorrow from mine eyes. Why died I not from the womb? Why did I not give up the ghost when I came out of the belly? If anybody was to want me to give them Anything that says, here is deep despair or deep, dark 
depression, I'd read these verses. I don't think you could find an inspiration recorded it uh, any better record of what it is to be in terrible state of depression. So in his terrible sufferings, and he didn't understand why he was suffering, he simply wishes that he'd never been born. Now it's important to note this though, that Job in these terrible depths of despair did not consider suicide. It's not there. Look in Job 2 and verse number 10. But he said unto her, speaking to his wife, she had said, you know, in the misery he was in, curse God and die. Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? And all this did not Job sin with his lips. That may give us an understanding of what we sometimes don't see in Job, but it's true of every one of us. We can't control a lot of things. Some things are out of our control. And God Almighty has not delegated to us the authority to end our own lives. Now, as time allows, I want to look at several different people and consider our question, why should someone want to take his or her own life? Let's go now from Job to the great prophet Elijah. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 4. We'll sum it up after successfully proving that Jehovah God is the one true and living God. There was nothing to Baal. Wicked Jezebel, showing the hardness and dishonesty of her heart, decided to kill him. Now, it seems that Elijah must have thought, well, once we've defeated these 450 prophets of Baal and God so vividly on top of Mount Carmel uh, did what he did to prove it and sending fire from heaven and all the water that was on everything and the water in the pit around it, it consumed every bit of it, that that would make a difference. But it shows how when you don't want to believe something and you've got your mind set on what you want and you're just wicked, it didn't to Jezebel. And this seemed to have depressed Elijah because certainly the, the, the uh, evidence was adequate. Under pressure, Elijah despaired and seems to have lost hope. In fact, he thought himself to be the only follower of God left on earth and he thought that even his work was a failure. Is that depression? It certainly is. Now pause here and realize some of the greatest servants God ever had on this earth went through times like this. After his best effort, he couldn't turn Israel from idolatry. But we must not miss the fact that Elijah wished for death. But we must not miss this fact. Nowhere does it record that he sought or even thought about taking his own life even in despair, he knew that the decision, that that decision was God's alone to make. However, God countered Elijah's lack of hope and this deep depression that he had gotten himself into. And you know how he did it? If you're familiar with Elijah after these times, he gave him very important tasks to do, to be involved in. And every one of those affected the future of Israel. I suggest to you that when you have the knowledge of God, and the Bible is the Word of God, and from it I learned how to live, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, and you have the understanding that life just does not end when this heart quits beating. You just simply leave this house, the soul's in, and go into another state of being in place of being. And when you've lived your life in harmony with God's will, you may have many times because of what can happen to you, what people can do to you, being in despair, 
But you had the wherewithal to rise up, and God understands those things. Don't forget that Jesus in the garden was in deep despair. Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But here's what they had that he had, and he had it perfectly. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And God also corrected Elijah's view. Remember, he said there's 7,000 that have not bowed the knee to Baal. So many times when we think it's the deepest and darkest and blackest, it's not really that way. I would simply say this, don't make any serious decision when you're like this. In his deep depression, Elijah was not a good judge of whether his life was worth living. He was not the one to do that. And God knows as finite, fallible, weak human beings, there are times when we don't need to be going on our own think so. Well, let's turn to Judas Iscariot. Matthew 27, 3 through 5, the scripture reads, Then Judas, which had betrayed him, that is Christ, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself, and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders saying, I have sinned, and that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See, see thou to it. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Again, 27, Matthew, verses 3 through 5. Now, we don't have a whole lot, but we have enough about Judas to understand he was not a good person. In John 12, verse 6, we learned that he was a thief. What does that say about the honesty or the lack of it of his heart? Luke 8, 15. Then he said, not that he cared, this is Judas, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag, he carried the group's money and bare what was put therein. I wonder how many times his hand dipped in that bag to get what he wanted. It seems, and I will underscore the word seems, it seems that Judas was always looking to make a fast buck, however he could. And again, we don't know this, but we do know humans. We do know how they act. And we've already seen this man doesn't have an honest heart. This man's a thief. It is possible that in his observation of how Jesus always managed to escape when the Jews came to arrest him or to kill him, that he thought he could make some quick money by offering to betray Christ, fully expecting Jesus to do as he had done several times before and walk away. But if, I say if, that were the case, it did not go as Judas planned. Now you say, well, why, why speculate on that? People don't just do things to do them. And we've already seen the man was deliberate in his dishonesty. So why wouldn't he think along that line? It's a possibility because that's the way people are. Jesus was arrested. He was condemned to die. Judas couldn't face his own guilt. He went out and hanged himself. What does that say about his understanding of God, of himself, being a creature of God, of what it is to be a servant of God? He just comments further to the pitiful character of the man and the deep dishonesty and his lack of respect for other people's property. He was in sad shape. Now, compare Judas to Saul of Tarsus. Saul was present at Stephen's death. And he was encouraging everybody to carry it out. He held the clothes of those that stoned Stephen, the first Christian martyr. He championed and led the persecution of the Lord's church. He himself said that he arrested many and dragged them into prison and putting some to death and making some blaspheme. Acts 8 verse 3. However, Jesus sought out Saul to be an apostle. And he, in talking to him, told him 
how to be saved from his sins. That is, Ananias did. He told him where to go to hear the preacher who he had selected and sent there. Street called straight, so he'd learn the plan of salvation. Now, he appeared to him not to convert him, but to make him an apostle so he could say, I've seen the risen Lord. And that wasn't the only time the Lord appeared to him, if you read the book of Galatians. Well, looking back on the time when Saul was rebellious to God, here's what the inspired, converted apostle Paul said. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor, and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. 1 Timothy 1, 12-15. I don't know what it would be like to come to the reality of the truth about Jesus Christ after he had done so much harm to people. Just Stephen alone would weigh heavy on a person's mind, but not with Paul. Paul actually knew God had forgiven him every sin. Paul did not spend his time, mark this, regarding depression in self-pity. He did not allow himself to be, to sink into deep depression. He even said at times, we are posed on every hand, we're despaired, even, but he did not say, that's where I wound up. When he learned the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, immediately he availed, availed himself of the opportunity to be forgiven by God. And then he launched into a lifelong, steadfast, zealous action of serving God. People go to psychologists and psychiatrists and they can help. But I've often said, he who put us together, our God, in the Word of God, has more insight into how we work mentally than the host of people do. And when we study these people, those who did commit suicide, those who did not, and we say, well, why did he and why he did not? And we look at Saul and you see, number one, all those horrendous evils he did. He knew he was forgiven. God held those things against him no more. His sins were washed away by the blood of Christ and baptism. Christianity is a religion of hope, and it never disappoints. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 5, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. At one time, as Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus in Ephesians 2.12, we didn't have God or any hope in the world. Now we're called to hold on to our hope which is the expectation of heaven for the faithful Christian, and we earnestly desire to receive that reward. The writer of Hebrews said in Hebrews 10, verse 23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful, that promise. To commit suicide, self-murder is nothing less than declaring one has given up all hope in God has forgotten why he's here, has forgotten eternity, and is thinking that he will end everything the moment his physical life is over. One reason people take their life is control. This is a problem for all sorts of problems, all sorts of people. One reason people in the Bible committed suicide was in a vain attempt to control their own destiny. I mentioned in our studies here over the years in the Bible and mental health that one of the great problems we have is to try to make this world conform to what I want. 
Now, I'm not talking about trying to teach people the truth and persuade them to believe in Christ and obey the gospel and live by the Bible. I'm talking about it so easy. If it's not done the way I've decided it ought to be done, it's not done right. And I fret, and I worry, and I'm anxious, and I'm agitated, and I'm irritated because I can't get anybody to do what I tell them the way I think it ought to be done. Now, if that's your attitude, you keep on that route, and you're going to find yourself sometimes in the mess that it, when it comes to its ultimate end, you can't get out of. Abimelech was, Judges 9, 53 through 54, was fatally struck by a rock thrown by a woman of all things. And he, as he was dying, did not want that uh, it known that a woman killed him. So he ordered his armor bearer to strike him dead. But what he didn't want to happen didn't work because right now I've just remembered that a woman was the cause of Abimelech's death, which he doesn't want me to remember anybody to know. Second Samuel eleven twenty one. He tried to change history, but he failed. Now, why is that in your Bible, and what do you get out of it for your own personal well-being when you read it? But then there's old King Saul, 1 Samuel 31, 4. Toward the end of his life, in the midst of battle, Saul's sons were killed, and he was mortally wounded by an arrow shot by a Philistine archer. And Saul, dying, feared the Philistines would abuse his dead body. It's strange for a man to be thinking like that. A servant of God when he should be setting his hopes, which he had given up some time ago, on eternity. So it didn't work when he was that concerned. Listen to what Scripture says, First Samuel 31, 8 through 10. And it came to pass on the morrow when the Philistines came to strip the slain, that they found Saul and his three sons fallen in Mount Gilboa. And they cut off his head and stripped off his armor and sent into the land of the Philistines round about publish it in the house of their idols and among the people and they put his armor in the house of Asheroth and they fastened his body to the wall of Bethshan now he didn't want to be abused <laughs> but he was once a person is dead that person no longer has any control you're not long in a position to change anything in the world if you live a hundred years old. But when you're dead, that ends it as far as you effectively being able to do anything else. Then there's a Hithophel, 2 Samuel 17, 23. Absalom had rebelled against his father David. Uh, one of David's advisors was a Hithophel, and he turned against David as a traitor and began advising Absalom. But in a critical matter, Absalom took the advice of somebody else. And Ahithophel knew that disaster was coming. So again, he, like Saul, wanted to control his own death. Well, the interesting, interesting thing is nothing changed. He's going to die one way or the other. But by removing himself from this world, he made it impossible for him to give Absalom any good advice to help his cause, as they viewed what would have been good advice. Every one of these cases, here's what they're interested in. Me, myself, and mine. Every one of them. They're not thinking about anybody else. They're not thinking about eternity. They're not thinking about being a conscious, personal entity the moment they die, just in another state, another place. They're not thinking about that at all. Do you think the rich man recorded by Jesus in the story of rich man Lazarus had any idea of what was going to happen to him as soon as he died? The scripture just said he lifted up his eyes being in torments. And that's what happened to these folks. Now, I'm not saying a person take, can't take a blow to the head or have a disease and messes their mind up and all that kind of thing. We're talking about what we are responsible for in the mental health. Well, time's about to get by, so I'm going to stop with, with this. Revenge. 
Some people kill themselves to get back somebody else. I want you to listen to what's said about Jonah. Ken's leading us through a study of the Mount of Prophets, and we studied Jonah that long ago. Jonah chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. What? Well, the people in Nineveh repented. He didn't want to repent. He looked forward to them getting smeared. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish. For I knew that thou art a gracious God, and merciful, slow to anger, and great kindness, or repentest thee of the evil. You almost hear him say, and I like that when it comes to Jews, but just forget about everybody else. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it's better for me to die than to live. Now what is he upset over? Because a whole host of people repented of their sins and God didn't destroy them. You know how he did what he did. Repentance was his message. And the people listened even to the king. But Jonah wanted them destroyed. They were the enemies of Israel. And lo and behold, to his chagrin, the people, including the king, took his message to heart, humbled themselves, repented of their sins. But he'd rather die than to see them repent of their sins. Does that tell us something that ought to warn us about how strongly we can be wrong? <laughs> Often people committing suicide then are trying to strike back at others whom they perceive is causing them harm. But if you notice, and I stop here, it all comes back to their thinking about themselves. Every time. So when you find all the Bible talking about being humble and meek and serving others as God directs it as part of being the Christian life. Do you understand why then it is said, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord? For as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Suicide holds no solution. It corrects no problems. It provides no control. It's a cowardly act, not a heroic one. It brings wrath of God upon the one seeking vengeance. It brings no comfort to the suffering soul. It only brings misery. The true solution is to humble yourself before God and His good word and say, Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. Command that I will obey. To believe in Christ with all your heart, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins with the resolve, as the Lord adds you to His church, to be faithful to Him no matter what. Because you see, you're looking beyond this life. You're looking to be able to be in a resurrected, glorified body when we see Him as He is beyond all things here. We understand this is a life that is a schoolroom. God teaches us the Bible is a textbook. The devil tempts us. All these things are passing away. Very quickly, they're passing away. These are temporary. Everything in this life is temporary. Even the hurt in this life is temporary. God understands all that. But there is that long home that's unending. And when we cease here and open our eyes to eternity, then that's another story. But only those will be in paradise who love the Lord, who do all they can to be obedient to Him and live faithful to Him unto death. If you need to obey the gospel, we urge you to do so. If as a child of God you've sinned, we urge you to repent of those sins and God's second law of pardon. Confess those sins and pray God to forgiveness. If you need to obey the truth, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.